on behalf of the Medscape and American College of Cardiology Center for Excellence, I'm delighted to be here to present a dialogue on lipid management. I'm Pam Tabb. I'm a cardiologist and professor of medicine at UC San Diego, and I'm delighted to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Steve Nissen. Well, thank you. Um, uh, it's Dr. Steve Nissen, and I am the Chief Academic Officer of the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Well, Steve, we got a lot to cover. There's been so much exciting data in the lipid management space, and you just presented the data from the Clear Outcomes Study. So tell us the top line results and what excites you about Clear Outcomes. Well, first of all, we were eager to do this study because uh, as I think most people know, there are a certain number of patients that get adverse effects, typically myalgias from statins, and they're very, very difficult patients to treat, and many of them are at very high risk. So vempedoic acid, the drug we studied, is a prodrug. It is only activated in the liver. It is not active in muscle or any other peripheral tissues. So it was an ideal drug to try in patients that couldn't tolerate statins. Uh, we recruited 14,000 patients. Uh, it was a global study, uh, over a thousand sites. Uh, they all had to have documented statin intolerance and they had to in writing state that they understood that statins were established for cardiovascular prevention, but that they would not and could not take a statin. In the trial, we got modest lipid lowering with vampidoic acid, about 22% LDL reduction. We also got about the same amount, about 22% reduction in high sensitivity CRP uh, we knew this drug had anti-inflammatory as well as lipid lowering effects. Uh, we didn't know if it would reduce cardiovascular events, but in fact it did. Uh, the hazard ratio for a four component endpoint was 0.87, that's death, stroke, MI, or coronary vascularization. For the harder three component endpoint of just death, stroke, and MI, the hazard ratio was 0.85, a 15% reduction. There was a 23% reduction in myocardial infarction, statistically significant, and there was a 19% reduction in coronary revascularization. So we concluded that vampidoic acid was an effective alternative uh, in those patients that simply could not take a statin uh, or would not take a statin. We were pleased with the results and it was about what we expected based upon the CTTC meta-analysis. And I also want to congratulate you for enrolling 48% women in the study. You really set the new paradigm of what we should be doing in our lipid lowering trials and that we can't have that excuse that we just can't do it. You showed us that we could do it even during the pandemic. One of the most interesting aspects of that study to me is your paper that you published in JAMA on the high-risk high primary prevention cohort. My opinion is that group is so underappreciated. We focus so much on secondary prevention. And to me, when we get to secondary prevention, it represents a failure on our part. It represents everything that's wrong with US healthcare today. And we focus all of our resources on secondary prevention. The procedures that we do are very expensive, but the elegance and art of medicine is really in identifying those patients that are under that umbrella of high-risk primary prevention and coming up with evidence-based strategies for them. And you demonstrated that so elegantly in your sub-analysis. So tell us about that. Well, first of all, you said that extraordinarily well, and I agree with everything you said. Underappreciated, undertreated group, less than 50% of high-risk primary prevention patients are being treated, and remarkably, uh, only a little more than half of diabetic patients uh, are, are getting the appropriate uh, LDL-lowering therapy, typically statins. So in clear outcomes, we wanted to have evidence for both primary and secondary prevention. And so 
we took a chance and we enrolled 30% of the patients with primary prevention. Uh, it was a very controversial and very difficult decision to do that. What happened was the primary prevention patients had a much larger treatment effect than the secondary prevention patients. There was a, for the four component MACE, a 30% reduction, it's highly significant. For three component MACE, there was a 36% reduction. For cardiovascular death, there was a 39% reduction. And for all cause mortality, a 27% reduction. Now, that should not surprise us. If you look back historically, there are a modest number of primary prevention studies that were done with statins. Jupiter comes to mind. It was stopped early for a 44% reduction in the primary endpoint. HOPE-3 had a very robust 20% reduction in the primary endpoint, all in primary prevention patients. And so these patients have a more modifiable substrate. They probably have a lot more lipid-laden plaque that can be uh, reduced with LDL lowering. Uh, we showed that in some of our intravascular ultrasound studies as well. And so, as you point out, they are a group that we can prevent disease in. And good doctors ought to prevent disease, not simply wait till the, tr till the disease is highly evident. So, we were pleased with the result. You know, uh, we really wanted to make that point and that's why we did the analysis. Now, that being said, there will always be criticisms of any subgroup analysis. But this subgroup was large. It was 4,200 patients. It was statistically heterogeneous from the primary result that we saw. So that was important and it was a pre-specified subgroup. And so I think people should use this as a wake up call that we need to identify people at risk before they have a myocardial infarction or a stroke or a stent and try to treat them aggressively. And I know you agree with that, you as you said. And I'm also very excited in, in, in the Victorian One Prevent trial that is currently ongoing, which is dedicated to high risk primary prevention. And we're looking at the impact of glycerin in, in these patients. So I think we're gonna see a lot more clinical trials in this high risk primary prevention cohort. Yeah. And hopefully will lead to a lot of different therapies that we can offer these patients. Yeah. So one and, of the- Yeah, I was gonna say, I, I, I'm involved as well. I'm chairing the data monitoring committee for the trial. So and I know you're on the executive committee. So this will be a chance for us to work together for a while. So one of the things about high risk primary prevention that I use clinically is, is coronary calcium scoring because it really identifies those patients with subclinical atherosclerosis. Do you use that in your practice? Only uh, when I'm on a, in a borderline situation. I try to be conservative about radiation exposure. I know the radiation exposure has been reduced substantially. And so if I have a patient that has a high LDL and risk factors and that by the clinical trials would qualify for treatment, I treat them. And if they're clearly well below the threshold for treatment, I avoid treating them. But if you're in that borderline group, that's where I think calcium scoring is useful. And I use two metrics, calcium scoring, and high sensitivity CRP. If you're in a borderline group and your CRP is four, then based upon Jupiter, you really ought to be treated. If you have a high, and if you have a high calcium score, you ought to be treated as well. I do the same. So let's switch gears for a minute and talk about obesity. So everybody has been mesmerized and dazzled by all of the data that's been coming out on GLP-1 receptor agonists and the dual agonists. But one of the things that I'm concerned about is a lot of people think that all you need to do is treat obesity. And if you treat obesity, you don't really need to worry about treating lipids. 
And so we need to put some of this in context. And I know you're involved in some of these clinical trials with terceptide. So tell us how you think about obesity and ASCVD and treatment of hyperlipidemia. Well, first of all, I think hyperlipidemia and obesity are independent risk factors. I think there's lots of evidence that they are. You can be thin and have a very high LDL. You can have, be obese and not have a high LDL. On many of these patients, in fact, what they have are high triglycerides associated with their obesity, as, as you well know. And yes, it's true. There is some improvement typically in triglycerides with weight loss, but there's not a huge reduction in LDL cholesterol. So I think the smart strategy is to address obesity, but not neglect the treatment of patients with high LDL. And I think we're gonna learn uh, in the future that these are very independent risk factors. And the opportunity to treat both of them gives us two opportunities to reduce morbidity and mortality from a disease that is the number one cause of death in, in developed countries. No, I think it's well said because I think that sometimes when we are mesmerized by data, we kind of forget about the basics, just like sometimes we forget about our good old friend, the statin, because there's so many new therapies, but we can't forget about the incredible data that we have with statins. So there's also a lot of new drugs in the pipeline. For instance, there's the oral PCSK9 inhibitor that's in clinical trials. There are multiple drugs for lipoprotein A lowering that are in phase three trials. There's even an oral drug for LPA lowering that was just presented at ESC by Dr. Steve Nichols. So, so many different things, including now gene editing. Uh, so I want to get your take on what are you excited about? What are you cautious about? And what do you think the future is going to look like? Well, first of all, lipoprotein little a, underappreciated, you know, um, I published a study last year called the Heritage uh, Trial, 48,000 patients, all of them had had a previous event and only 13% of them had had a lipoprotein A actually drawn. So we have been getting for more than 10 years, my colleague, Leslie Cho, who heads up prevention here, has been obtaining lipoprotein A for about 15 years in every single patient that comes to our prevention clinic. So we see a lot of this. I'm chairing, and Dr. Cho is the principal investigator for the LPA Horizon trial, uh, studying uh, pelicarsin, which is a uh, uh, anti-sense oligonucleotide, uh, and it is uh, very effective at lowering lipoprotein A in phase two trial. The phase three trial is 8,300 patients, fully enrolled, ongoing, and probably just a couple years from completion. We're going to get an answer. I think the answer is going to be that if we lower lipoprotein A, we will reduce cardiovascular events. I'm very excited about this target. And there are other targets emerging as well. Another very important emerging target is APOC3. Uh, there are now uh, short interfering RNA drugs targeting APOC3. And there's an antisense oligonucleotide as well. For lipoprotein A, we have the oral drug, muvolaplin. I worked with Steve Nichols on that uh, manuscript. And uh, there are other short interfering RNA uh, drugs in phase two and in phase three. We have multiple shots on goal. Look, statins are fantastic, but even if we lower LDL, we still have incident cardiovascular disease. We have to look now beyond LDL. We cannot neglect treating LDL with statins and PCSK9 inhibitors and pempidoic acid. We got very good tools, but it's not eliminating cardiovascular disease. So we've got to look to the next generation. Now, CRISPR is a fantastic opportunity to actually change the genome. Obviously, it has a lot of regulatory hurdles to overcome but 
we we're looking now into the future and we are seeing really amazing opportunities for other targets to be treated uh, with gene uh, editing therapy. Do you have any concerns about gene editing? Do you think there might be any off-target effects? Well, that's, of course, the concern, and the regulators are going to be concerned about as well. What's good about antisense oligonucleotides and short interfering RNAs is they target one very specific messenger RNA. And so they don't seem to have off-target effects. They're very well targeted. They're connected to a, a sugar, Galnac, that concentrates the therapy in the liver and and not in other tissues. So again, it's very targeted. Uh, I think uh, they're gonna turn out to be safe. CRISPR will have to meet the same high standard. The regulators need to be convinced, but I'm optimistic that that can be accomplished with careful studies and with careful design of therapies. Yeah, the concept of one and done, especially for our patients who have genetic syndromes like homozygous familial hypercholesterolemia is very appealing. So we're gonna have so many different options ranging from the one and done strategy to once a month to every six months with some of the LDL lowering agents. So I think the future is bright and we're gonna have a lot to talk about uh, over the next couple of years. So I want to thank you for your time and your insights on some of the new developments in lipid lowering. Well, thank you very much for having me, and it's been uh, a pleasure to converse with you.